Today's power lunch is with Robert John Sabrapena, fondly called Bob by his friends. He financed and built the MRT and developed Camp John Hay, among many other projects. Today, I pick his brain on how to solve Manila's traffic problems and find out how his team at Camp John Hay is keeping the beauty of Baguio intact. So, um, this is Power Lunch and it's um, Manila's Week's new online show. Uh, it's trying to put uh, my two worlds together, so it's like eating and having lunch with powerful people. Italian food? Uh, I love Italian food. I understand. Yeah. I heard from the grapevine that your daughter got married in Italy. Uh, yes, she did. Uh, my, my eldest got that? married uh, in Chianti in uh, Tuscany. Oh my god. So uh, did you drink Chianti? Of uh, course. Of course. We were, <laughs> we were in the middle of uh, wine country. Oh my goodness. Chianti. Ang ganda naman. Uh, oh, and yes. Of course. Yeah. And um, it was an old uh, chalet that uh, we took over. and. Uh, basically had the wedding right there. You took over a chalet? Yeah, well, the entire... Spell. No, just kidding. <laughs> Did you cry giving your uh, father of the bride uh, speech? I tried to... Uh, yeah, a bit, you know. Of oh. course, that was my first daughter, so it's, oh it's a bit emotional. Yeah, but, uh, of course. I actually had my glasses on, my shades. So you could hide your tears? Uh, kinda. <laughs> but so I'm thinking of having the Mama Lou's pizza. Yeah, that's since, good. Um, pizza is good. Since it has their name yeah. on it. They have uh, or the Vongole. Like the Vongole is good here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, Vongole it is. One thing that not a lot of people know about you, but I know it because um, my father is also uh, Protestant, mm. is that um, your family is very grounded in um, church. Uh, yes, right? my, my, my grandfather was a bishop, Bishop Sobrepeña of uh, uh, the Church, Were uh, they, uh, United uh, Church of Christ. United uh, Church of Christ. Is that UCCP? Yes, UCCP, United Church of Christ in the Philippines. Every Sunday was Bible time, Bible reading. But how did you uh, end up becoming such a great businessman? Did, did you study entrepreneurship or no, something? No, I, I studied business uh, in La Salle. Yeah, Adobo! Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I studied business in uh, La Salle um, and uh, business management. Uh, Liacom, actually. Uh, oh, Liacom. May Liacom na ba nun? <laughs> uh, meron na, meron na. Yeah. Are you sure? So, liberal arts, uh, this combination. So, I had a degree in uh, philosophy. Philosophy? Psychology. Philo actually, philosophy, major in philosophy, minor in psychology. Actually, no. I have two degrees. De a degree in psychology and business management. Ah, okay, okay. But so it's I have, psychology I have minored enough, in philosophy. But I had enough units to have a third degree, which was in philosophy. Really? Yeah, which uh, I took a lot of units out of interest. Wow. Out of interest. You yeah. know who else is a philosophy major? Yeah. Cardinal Tagle. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so into <laughs> Cardinal Tagle. <laughs> okay. I started out in marketing, in sales, from college. In so I was a, basically a salesman, okay, so literally on the ground, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, a company called American Sales Masters of John Clements. So that's how I started selling those programs. Eventually, I became a trainer myself, uh, implementing those uh, market management programs. And um, that led to a certain company who took me on as their training director, wow. which was a real estate company. I never really... Uh, thought I'd be in real estate, but uh, a real estate company took me on as their training director. Wow. And in six months, I became the marketing director, you know, uh, and from there, I put up uh, real estate. So we started literally from the ground up, from zero. What are your top five uh, real estate projects? That's tough. It's like asking a father who are your favorite uh, kids. You know? How, how many real estate projects has Phil Estate had? About 54. Oh my God. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So uh, as far as Mindanao, like um, from north yeah, to yeah, south? Yeah, all the oh, way. Wow. This one besides Mindanao. Yeah. And Southwoods has been alive for how many years now? We just oh. celebrated our 25th anniversary. Wow. Uh, Congratulations. So, yeah. so not just the project, I actually had to learn golf. Oh, that's I, I had, before Southwoods. You didn't know how to no, play golf. No, no, I was a tennis player. So no way. Yeah, I, I thought uh, golf was for old men. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Nicklaus. V. Jack. V. Nicklaus. Jack Nicklaus, mm. uh, who I hired to do the uh, golf course, and it took me three days to convince him because wow. he didn't want to do it, uh, just because he was so busy. And 
Um, what? That's kind of fast. <laughs> it usually takes me like months to convince I, I a person. Fast. <laughs> <laughs> but three but, days. But three days with him and talking to him. and uh, But, you know, um, eventually when I convinced him, and he said, uh, Bob, so now that we're doing a, a project together, let's play golf. And, you know, I, I freaked out because, my, oh my God, I'm going to tell him I don't. I, I, haven't, un <laughs> yeah. I haven't understood all his golf jokes and all his, what the last <laughs> three days. You were like a window lang the whole time. Window lang because, you know, I didn't want to. So, so finally he says, well, you know, it's, it's the first time. Uh, it's the first time, uh, he said, in all my courses, that uh, there is somebody talking to me about building one who is not a golfer, <laughs> who hasn't played a game. So he said, and he said, but you must be a golfer. So uh, you must become a golfer. Yeah, become a golfer. So he gave me my first set. No, I, how cool is that? Your first set is from Jack. I took from Jack Nicklaus, yeah. and he arranged my first lesson. Wow. With Jim Flick, his uh, golf instructor. Oh so, my God, you must be really good at golf. Yeah. He's you're, you're the Jack Nicklaus of uh, food. Right? Uh, oh, yeah. Bolero, I you love can, it. You can teach marketing, him, marketing you sense. Can, you can teach him something <laughs> about food. Yeah, that's like, that's the dream. Another project that's very special to me is Camp John Hay. One of the first projects they bidded out mm. in the mid-90s was Camp John Hay. And uh, so that's... Yeah. Uh, something that we won uh, by way of bidding, public bidding. By this time, you already knew how to play golf. Yes, <laughs> I had. Uh, by that time, I had about five five years of playing golf. Is it also a Jack Nicklaus design? It is also a Nicklaus design. Wow! Yeah. So, okay, that's amazing. So we did a few projects together. Camp John Hay is a Phil Estate project. It's very special because of uh, what it is, Camp John Hay, and all the trees. I think Camp John Hay is special to so many people just yes, because of the yes, memories. The memories, that are what it means, childhood, kind of uh, people who grew up, you know. And I think it's the place that has really maintained the beauty of Baguio, like all correct, these correct. years. It's because of the trees. I heard that um, at Camp John Hay, you have really made it a point to. Um, preserve the environment and plant a lot of trees. Is yes, that yes. Uh, when I took over Camp John Hay in the mid-90s, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there were about 250,000 trees when I took over. There's close to 500,000 trees now. So we, we, I, I planted about 230 to 240,000 trees there. Sorry, again? There are around 500,000 trees now in yeah, Camp John Hay yes. alone. It's a bit overpopulated now with trees. Yes, more food. See, it's me. Oh, nice, <laughs> nice. Okay. So, welcome to my world. I, I wish I didn't have breakfast. <laughs> you, you can also get into food. I can get into food. I think food, you can yeah. sell anything. Like, yeah, yeah, you can yeah. sell um, this uh, <laughs> bottle of cheese, <laughs> olive oil. I understand with Camp John Hay, you're also selling coffee. Is that correct? We, well, we. Oh. we yes, take a we, we, well, yeah, we actually, you know, we. Um, no, I love coffee. So, okay. coffee is. One of the things that I'm really uh, that I really enjoy, um, and uh, so it's hard to find new good coffee. Mm -hmm. So I started dabbling in uh, beans, in beans, mm -hmm. and then roasting, and then uh, making my own coffee, and then. Do so you know how to make coffee now? Yeah, yeah, like you know how to grow coffee now? Yes, I actually, we actually do. We grow it in John Hay. Wow. We have uh, seventy thousand trees. What? Yeah, planted inside Camp John Hay. Like maybe five years ago, I think already. Like I yeah. was able to visit like the farm when it yeah. was just yeah. starting yeah. out. And um, I love how, cause I, I saw it, I was able to tour it. Yeah. It's super pretty. And um, I love how you planted the coffee trees mm -hmm. between the pine trees. Pine trees, yeah. Yeah, I think that was brilliant. The, um, the first worry, uh, my, my worry in John Hay has always been uh, forest fires. Okay. Because let's face it, if some if a forest fire breaks out in John Hay with five hundred thousand trees yes. that close to each other, there's really nothing we can do, right? Okay. Now, so the best in my mind, the best way to control forest fires was the coffee plantation. Coffee plantation would have drip irrigation, mm -hmm. and the drip irrigation would keep the ground moist. Mm -hmm. And if you have a gr ground moist all the time. If there's the water on the ground, then unlikely the fire will, will never happen. Kale. So, so because normally cigarette butts, things like yes, that. Yes, yeah. So, 
the same time, the, the coffee needs shade because, uh, and so the, the pine trees give it the best shade. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's the logic or the reasoning behind that. Parang I'm having this impression that you're some kind of a master of the win-win solution. Right, right, right. Mr. Bob Superpeña, this is Richard. Hi, Richard. He's the owner of Mama Lou. Nice to meet you. Okay. The Mama Luz that I have visited is the one in BF Homes. Okay. It's also so pretty. Yeah. And um, my dog Stardust has been there. Ah. <laughs> Maybe when you're coming in from your, South Hood. Your wife? Or? Yeah, well, well, yeah, she uh, actually passed away uh, six and a half years ago. Ah. Yeah. Wow. So, life goes on. and. Uh, is she the one? Is, are these her recipes? Uh, actually, a lot of some of the recipes are uh, what she created. A lot of them are from my great grandmother. That was Italian, but me being French Canadian, I was born and brought up in Montreal. Mm. But at home, we spoke French, but I think 80% of the time, we think Italian food. What are the favorite yeah. things you like to do when you're in Baguio? Do you just chill or? Uh, yeah, uh, besides playing golf, uh, I love eating there. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, you have a very good chef. We have a very good chef. One of my Bill, favorite yeah, chefs. Yeah, Billy King's there, and he experiments uh, with me. Oh, you know, I really? Mean, <laughs> Oh yes, I remember one time I went up and uh, you were there and uh, he has this amazing lamb caldereta. You made right, me try that. Right, yes. Right. So he, he comes up with new things and uh, makes me try it and uh, sometimes it finds its way in the menu if it's really good. Really? Know, or... I love how he's expanded his catering. I was able to attend, uh, one of my best friends got married in Cap Chan oh, yeah. And now it's, uh, you know, people are making new memories. Like yes. great memories, yeah, like I mean, yeah, weddings right. and stuff. So we have a lot of weddings at the manor mm -hmm. uh, and the lodge. So a lot of weddings are held there. Uh, practically almost every weekend, there's a wedding happening. <laughs> so it is a favorite wedding venue now. I hope you are able to manage it forever. <laughs> yeah, well, I hope so. I think so. Uh, that's yeah. the idea. So we've done Southwoods, Camp John Gay, and uh, what are your other Phil Estate? Um, the third would be, well, probably the MRT. Is that also a Phil Estate project? Yes. There was a different founder? I always thought that you were the founder of the MRT. Originally, it was a fellow named Ellie Levine. Okay. And he's the... the Is he related to Adam Levine? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know Adam Levine? I know Adam Levine, yeah. <laughs> okay, you have children. <laughs> of course. Yeah, no, yeah, I listen to his music. Why not? Okay, millennial. Yeah. Ellie Levine won the bid. Okay. In 1990, I think, mm -hmm. 1990, um, and he, it was a bid made by Cory, President Cory Aquino. So from Cory Aquino pa pala ang Yeah, Cory, the President Aquino, bidded that out, mm -hmm. uh, Levine won it, however was unable to fund it. He was unable to raise the money to build it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I came along in 95, bought it from him, and uh, I funded it together with my partners. Ayala is part owner of the MRD. Yeah, Ayala, oh, okay. uh, United Lab Group. Really? Yeah. Where did you drive? The National Bookstore Group. National Fred Bookstore Ramos. is part yeah. owner yeah, of the MRD. These are my partners, yeah. Oh, see, so I don't think a lot of people know that. Yeah, yeah. Because so, when people think MRT, they automatically think Bob Subrapeña. Like when they yeah. think MRT Corporation, they think Bob Subrapeña. So we started construction in 96, 97, mm -hmm. over there. And we finished it in year 2000. We inaugurated it in year 2000. So, it was a project that was an idea maybe of Cory Aquino. It was, it was envisioned and bidded out by Cory. Uh, and then Ramos. Im implemented by uh, Ramos during the Ramos administration. And it was completed and inaugurated by President, President Era. President Era. And then um, maybe further developed under the Arroyo administration? Uh, well, well, during the GMA administration, it, it, we, were, we were trying to negotiate the expansion, but somehow we, we didn't come into terms. Um, but one good thing that the uh, Arroyo administration mm -hmm. maintained was uh, Sumitomo and mm -hmm. the maintenance. Mm -hmm. They kept Sumitomo on board. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, during the time of Pinoy, uh, that, that's when a lot of problems really happened. They yes. terminated Sumitomo and uh, mm -hmm. the system started deteriorating very fast. Okay, but now um, are you still involved with the MRT? Because it, it appears like a lot of um, management is being done by the government since they took Sumitomo out. Yes, uh, mm. 
to the first question, yes, I'm, I'm still the chairman of the MRT, and uh, and the original board members are back on the board. Oh, that's great. Uh, and we're in control of the company. Uh, however, uh, we're, the maintenance is is uh, now being done by government itself. Uh, but they're having a hard time because uh, it involves a lot of money, spare parts, uh, and of course... The, Maybe the just experience. Experience, uh, management experience in doing this thing. So um, they're now putting a lot of effort in bringing back Sumitomo, our original contractor. So which is, which is a good thing and which is something we support. When did you give your proposal for capacity expansion? Oh my God, we... <laughs> it, way back. Uh, the first one actually went out in year 2000, would you believe? When we finished phase one, we gave a proposal for phase two and capacity expansion. Okay, our proposals went nowhere, and then and then it started becoming very political after that. Okay, uh, when uh, the Aquino administration came in, it was very political. Uh, so we we were not identified uh, with their. Uh, so we were not identified with their party. So, so, but I, you know, I think, I mean, that's that's good when it's election time. You know, yes. there are different colors, different parties. That's part of the democratic process, right? But once you're in, you gotta do what's right for the public. That's true. But at the same time, I also you know? say, you no, know, when a president is elected. Whoever you voted for during yeah. elections, you yeah. drop it because yeah. he's and, our president. And that's, like that's, we that all was work with uh, him. exactly my, my thinking too. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, it wasn't two way. No? It yeah. was not a two way. <laughs> Unrequited love. Uh, Were you so, hurt? <laughs> well, the, project, the public was hurt. The project got hurt and the public got hurt. The public was that's hurt, the riding public. You know, masakit. The easiest part was adding trains. Yeah. and maintaining. That, to us, is the easiest part. Your first proposal was 2000. After 2000, under GMA, you also gave capacity expansion yes. proposal. So that yeah. would be around maybe 05, 06? 03, 04. 04, wow. Unfortunately, um, at that time, the DOTC was saying the, the need is so great. We need to buy second-hand trains. Why? Yeah. And Why would you buy second-hand? Because it's faster. Because to buy new trains, two years. To buy second hand, it's ah, so pa. and then you recondition. But we refuse to do it because we have to guarantee the trains. Yes, and it's long term. So yeah, and can't... we cannot guarantee second hand trains. We're gonna buy all the old trains from Europe, the discarded trains. Uh, yeah. We're not gonna do that. So, mm. so basically, that's the reason it stalled during the GMA days. The, mm. the, there were policies set that we should buy uh, second hand trains. Mm. We refused, and so nothing happened. And of course, when, when Aquino came in, it was the complete other way. Oh they bought goodness. brand new trains from the wrong manufacturer. Hindi <laughs> uh, So, Are they just going to throw those trains? I'm hearing in the news that they will kind of force it to fit. Force to fit. Parang stepsister si Cinderella. Pinipilit yung sapatos. Yeah, well... Uh, is it possible? You know, anything is possible, especially if China and its government will put its resources into... What does that mean? Because let's face it, this is a Chinese train. Mm -hmm. And I believe the Chinese government will do everything in its power to make that thing work somehow. But won't it be delicado to ride it? I mean, are they Well, I hope they do the a good job safety? of it. There are qualified train uh, LRV makers in China. There are qualified ones. Um, Not this particular one because they had never done it. But if they put their collective uh, expertise together, they could possibly fix it, right? Customize, customize, customize it. Customize it, change many things, make it work. Now, the question is, is can it be guaranteed uh, by a top-notch maintenance uh, provider like Sumitomo? Okay, let's put it this way. Uh, when I ordered the original trains from the Czech Republic, okay, uh, Sumitomo had representatives in the manufacturing plant watching the, where the steel came from, how it was put together. I mean, every day they were there watching. Wow. They knew what steel was used, they knew the nuts and bolts, the engines, everything that went wow. in. They never had that benefit with the Chinese trains. Right, it's like going in there blind. Yeah, so the Czech trains, the, the trains we use now, they know those are good because they were there. Right? They, they can guarantee. 
Yeah, because they have to guarantee. Mm -hmm. They will never. They they were not there for the Chinese thing, so mm -hmm. they'll. I don't. It's going to be unlikely that they guarantee that. Mm -hmm. In in which case, if they are not able to guarantee it, will they still? Be able to use, will the government still be able to use those Chinese trains or probably not anymore? Is it going to be like the Bataan nuclear power plant? Um, the there will have to be, uh, um, the way to do it is, uh, there are many guarantees. We have guarantees as owners. Uh, the maintenance provider, Sumitomo, will have guarantees. So an agreement will have to be made that we will consent, MRTC, my company will agree, that government deal directly with Sumitomo. Sumitomo, on the other hand, will agree to fix the whole system. Mm -hmm. uh, as to the Chinese trains, that matter is between Sumitomo and the government. Uh, right? Okay. As far as we're concerned, we can agree that they deal with, with uh, Sumitomo directly. And uh, that much we can agree to. But I think as owners, you would have to um, welcome the trains if they will ever attach it to your original system, right? Well, we definitely welcome trains, as long as they don't damage the system mm -hmm. and they're not dangerous to the public. Yeah, but, well, yeah, what I mean is you would have to give your go if they will use it, or, well, or bang hindi? Legally, yes. Mm -hmm. Legally, yes, uh, because we own the system. Right? Yeah, we own the system, so legally, we have to say, yes, you can use it, mm -hmm. it's safe, it's all right. Mm -hmm. But our definition of safe is a bit different because our definition of safe is found in contracts and standards. Our definition of safe is like the trains that I bought, we ran it 5,000 kilometers under test in the plant. That means running 5,000 kilometers um, at 60 kilometers per hour. After that was tested for 5,000 kilometers, 60 kilometers per hour, and it passed. We shipped it in. That's why you can guarantee that it'll last 100 yeah, years. Yeah, no, not only that. When it got here, we ran it another 30 days, filled with sandbags, the weight sandbags, yeah. to approximate the weight of a full load of people. And we ran it for 30 days, morning, noon, and night. Before it was even used. Before the first person used it. Mm -hmm. It went through that whole thing. That's this, a lot of preparation. Now, the Chinese, and that's what we consider safe. Yeah. Right? That's your standard. That's my standard. Of safety. Safe. Yes. It's actually, it's also in the contracts. Mm -hmm. uh, the terms of reference require it. Now. The terms of reference from the government. From our contract mm -hmm. in those days, even today, the terms of reference with the Chinese trains required a 5,000 kilometers. Yeah, which they did it. not do. Which they didn't do. Mm -hmm. So they just arrived here. And they were even assembled here. Okay, so it's a violation of contract. It is technically. Yeah, in the in the past administration, they did not implement the contract as envisioned. So now I think they're planning to run the same trains and put the passengers and test it with passengers. They're going to make those sandbags real people. Yeah, yeah, basically. So that's to us. That's not uh, our standard of safe. I hope government uh, realizes that and and. and uh, Get on the same page. Another thing that I read before, I'm so sorry that you've kind of uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, stalled, it's stalled on the food. Yeah, it's so good. Maybe you can right. reheat it later. Um, another thing that, uh, one, one interesting that I remember reading before was that the owners themselves were not allowed to inspect the trains under the Aquino administration. Yes. Uh, they, we, were, we had written them many times. We wanted to inspect the system, which was deteriorating fast. We have wanted to inspect the trains, and they refused. They refused uh, us to inspect it. How? What is that? Like, how can you not even check your own trains? I don't. Parang I can't grasp. <laughs> <laughs> well, again. And how uh, was it okay with you guys? It was not okay. That's why we brought them to court. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. and uh, we actually filed a case against those Chinese trains, the Dalian trains. You know. Because safety, no. Yeah, and all of that. So I, we went to court to try to stop it. But unfortunately, the court ruled that it was moot. Moot because the time we filed it, government had already paid the down payment. I know, una silang I think when they heard we were gonna file a case, they, they made the payment. So, <clears throat> so the, the ruling was uh, the TRO that we were asking for to stop the order uh, was too late. 
So now we have moot trains. Now you have moot trains. <laughs> From a moot case to a moot train. <laughs> moot trains. Oh my goodness. But you know, I, in retrospect, everything I had said in the past has been proven correct. So what's the future of the MRT? Because I feel like um, even if uh, President Duterte made a campaign promise to fix the MRT, it doesn't seem to have been fixed yet. Is that a is that a public sector duty or is it a private sector um, duty? It was a um, it was a right. Uh, the word would be a, a right. It was a right of a private sector of my company, MRTC, Metro Rail Transit Corp, to basically um, maintain and expand the system. Right. However, uh, government. Uh, never acted on a lot of the proposals to basically maintain. So the right was taken away from you. <laughs> yeah, and uh, to add trains was also not acted upon during the Aquino administration. Um, both the maintenance and adding trains, which was our right, was basically taken away during the administration of uh, President uh, Aquino. Um, and of course, uh, the secretary who basically did that at that time was Secretary Rojas, Simar Rojas. And he was the one who basically uh, ended the Sumitomo contract uh, with MRT. And then eventually, to make things worse, they ordered new trains. The Dalian trains. From China, which mm -hmm. from a manufacturer who had never built uh, this kind of a train. and. And, you know, I, I went on, on, the, on the record to, on media, in the Senate, in Congress, saying that that manufacturer will never be able to make this train work because they've never done it before. So and you were right, because I think I, they yeah. haven't used it and until now. All these years, it's been delivered, it just sits there and they haven't used it. And there are technical problems. Four billion pesos yeah. on these new coaches right. that to this day are not being used. They're not being used because they're not compatible for technical reasons. Yet, the administration then knew that they would not be compatible because you had made your statements on record. I had made my statements. They unfortunately ignored it. Let's put it this way. We, we built the system. We know the system. We, so we know what will work and what won't work. Whenever new administrations come in, they come up with their own ideas and sometimes it's not compatible with what is right. So and that's so, a problem. And that's a problem. So when what we think and what they think are not the same, then they just ignore us, right? They so, should give the experts the leeway. Yeah. In this case, we are the experts because we built it. It was our project. We built it. We guaranteed it. We made it work all those years. With us. I think it's great that um, regardless of administration, um, you're just you're just really concerned about the public safety we're, and making it run yeah, properly. We're just doing the right thing. We know what's what will work, what won't work. We know what's what the requirement is and the standards are, and we're just trying to stick by it. Yeah. Because I think what the DOTR was trying to do is to um, bring in Sumitomo through a um, what is it called? A government, government to government, government to government, government to government uh, deal with JICA. Yeah. With JICA, meaning not going through MRT Corporation correct, correct, anymore. Correct. But um, I'm surprised that you're okay with it. I'm okay with it because all along we've just wanted Sumitomo to go back in. In our contract, <laughs> we have a provision there. It's called a pass-through uh, provision that allows government and ourselves to basically bring a company like Sumitomo. So it's essentially the same. Yeah, and that government can deal directly with Sumitomo. So in, in spirit, that is in our contract. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the only difference being, in our contract, we choose the contractor, and then government deals with them, negotiates directly. But in this case, since it's Sumitomo anyway, then it's, then it's absolutely our, fine. Then they're our choice. So it's, you know, uh, so no problem. It's In spirit, it has complied with uh, our agreement. always see in the newspapers every time the um, the the other people try to um, attack MRT or the or the corporation is they always bring up the college assurance plan yeah and they always associate it with your name sorry to ask um, why okay two things mm. when the, they talk about the MRT 
they can't attack the project because the project is good. There's nothing really you can attack or say bad about the mass transport project itself. So that was really a PR job uh, to demolish my name in order to affect our, pro you know, proposals in the MRT. But is CAP one of your projects? Do you own CAP? No, no. Actually, that's a company of my father, okay. Enrique Sobrepeña. And, uh, Did you ever work? No, I never CAP? worked uh, for CAP. I was never, I, I was not a director, especially in those days. That all of this was happening. Uh, I don't think I'm even a shareholder of CAP, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, but this is my father, who happened, and we have the same name. And uh, CAP invested in some real estate projects, true, like MRT, like Southwoods, like Renaissance. They were all successful, and CAP made a lot of money on it for its plan holders, right? Wait, okay. When CAP makes money, it should be a good thing because yes. that would be going back to those who invested in CAP. Yes. Like if the I bought, if I bought. Um, what yeah. are they called? Uh, policies. Policies. If I bought a policy from CAP, I would want CAP to earn. Yes, yes. Because the money would go back to the me. earnings go to the plan holders. Okay. Yeah, for their educational plans. So the more they make money, the, the better for the plan. Because I have friends who, who are CAP graduates. Yeah, we CAP graduated over a hundred thousand hmm. graduates. Like my classmate in law school was yeah. a CAP baby. Yeah, yeah. There's mm -hmm. a lot, and it should have been more, right? Mm -hmm. So what happened? How come, on the other hand? I do hear from some media practitioners that parang they're, um, they weren't able to collect or something like that. What, what happened there? No, what, what happened to CAP, uh, the real story, is uh, the regulations, the thing that killed CAP, and the other, not just CAP, the other pre-need companies as well. What because killed all the pre-need industry? The, the educational pre-need industry died. Okay. <laughs> You know, and was damaged irreparably by the fact that the regulations and the regulators changed the policies of regulating. And uh, okay, English, please. <laughs> okay, I'll make it. I'll try to make it as simple as possible. Um, what the regulators? By regulators, I mean the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission. Then, in those days, the pre need industry is regulated by the SEC. SEC. It has always been regulated yes, by the SEC. Correct, always been. And it grew. Uh, and there were never any problems. Aside from CAP, there were also other yeah. um, companies such as? as such as Phil, Phil um, Plans, uh, Prudential. There were many. All in the education field. Yeah, there were many, industry. many companies, Philippine companies in yes. the educational plan business. Now, what happened was they tried, the regulators implemented. <clears throat> insurance policy regulations to pre need Now, that sounds a bit technical, but there's a big difference. Um, the insurance industry, when you regulate, something can happen tomorrow. Insurance. A fire can happen, somebody can die, and so the insurance company, they have to put up a fund, right? So if you're an insurance holder and your house burns down, I have to pay for the damages, right? Or typhoon, I have to pay damages. Or in, in case of, the, of uh, those kinds of accidents. For two of those events. We, the insurance companies, have to put up a fund, a reserve, as we call it, a reserve. In the insurance industry, it's called an actuarial reserve liability. In other words, the government, the, the SEC dictated that insurance companies need to have an actual, actuarial no. reserve no. liability. It's the insurance commission because uh -huh. the insurance industry is governed uh, in a, uh, by the insurance commission. Okay, so educational pre need is under SEC. Insurance uh, insurance companies are under insurance, insurance commission. commission. Yes, the different IC. body altogether. Different, yeah, okay. because they're different kinds of companies. Okay. Now, okay. So under the insurance commission, uh, they require that a insurance reserve. companies have a fund, a, a, a reserve fund, fund. A reserve fund called an, an ARL, actuarial reserve. For like, immediate needs. For of emergency holders. needs. Mm -hmm. Fire tomorrow, death tomorrow, flood, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, by contrast, education. Mm -hmm. When your child is born, he will go to college 
college plans, right? Yeah, 12 years, 15 well, years, Well, maybe not 12, years. 17 years, right? Yeah, genius kasi ako. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. okay. In 17 approximately years for college, yes, 17 yes. years, and then he goes to college, right? 17 to 18. Now, from birth, there's no way that your kid will go to college tomorrow. Right. Nor the next year nor at year two, nor at year three, only at year seven. Yeah, so in other words, you don't need an actual... You don't need uh, that fund. Yeah, you don't need right? that fund. Because there's no way he's going to go to college tomorrow. Mm. A study was made that if you grow the fund by 10% per annum, 10%, by the time he's of age to go to college, there will be enough money for him to pay tuition. Mm. Therefore, the only thing the SEC has to regulate is the growth of 10% per annum. To ensure that yeah. by the 17th year, you There's will have enough that money. fund. Yeah. So, the only thing they regulated was the 10%. Mm. So, for so long as your fund was growing by 10% per annum, kumikita ng 10% per annum, for sure your kid will be able to go to college. Okay? What happened then, that's why the investments of CAP in real estate and all of that, Ensured the 10%, the 10%. guaranteed the 10%. Percent. Because the returns were better than 10%. Mm. That's why it made sense. Yes. Now, um, what the regulators did was they put the cap and the other companies in the premium under the insurance policy. It, under the insurance commission? No. Under the insurance policy. First. Uh, in other words, it was still under the SEC, but they used the policies of the Insurance Commission to apply to the uh, pre -need, education pre-need uh, policies. Correct. So now what happened? Under the insurance, the entire cost of your house is a liability. Because it can burn tomorrow. Mm. Right? So dapat yung value ng buong bahay mo is, is in the reserve. Okay. Because it might burn tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. So there is an, it's called an actuarial reserve liability. Now, applying the same principle that it can happen tomorrow, they now all of a sudden required all the premium companies to have the full tuition of the children in their fund tomorrow. So no, wala ning 10% per annum. Wala na. So they required in, immediately the next day. Isa niyo kukunin yung pera for that? Impossible, right? Impossible. So because the the parents are paying over a five to ten year yes. plan. No? So where did all the pre-need education pre-need so companies what, get the money? Well, they could not. So what happened was because they imposed this gigantic amount from the future tomorrow, hindi na makailangan, di ba? Nagkaroon ng liability, what they call a negative liability. Overnight, CAP, which is very strong, which, is, which had surpluses, became negative, as well as all the other pre-need companies. That killed it. So who, because all of a sudden, the headlines were oh, cap negative, mm. cap negative, or everybody became negative. Who was the... Was it an SEC commissioner? Uh, it was under the... Uh, the chairman then was uh, Lilia Bautista. And was it a... Uh, like an... Ex what is it called? An SEC order yes, or it something? Yes, it was under the SEC. It was an SEC regulation. They just... By the stroke of a pen. Serious? Yeah, by the stroke of a pen, all the educational uh, plans became negative. So, paano yung... Now, CAP was the largest. Hmm. The largest. It had a huge market share, the leader and the largest. And so it had the largest negative. Mm -hmm. So, and then all of a sudden, they blame it on Sobre Oh my God. It had nothing to do with me. <laughs> that whole thing had nothing to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, unfortunately, uh, the way they spun it, to cover their tracks, the people who did it. That's a uh, they simplified so it, discouraging. Uh, by saying, "Oh, so prepare me," and they spent all the money on his projects. Our our, pro our projects made money. So were all the pre need education pre need companies affected? Yeah, and, or and just this is the last. Mm. If it was mismanaged, uh, we would accept it. But all the companies went under. All. I mean, I would imagine because it applies all. to all. Phil Am uh, plans got sold, <laughs> right? Phil Am? Phil Am plans got Surprising. sold. Surprising. Yeah, Prudential, everybody. Mm. All the all the leaders, all the top 10 went under. Mm, nice. So um, even the um, policy holders of Phil Am, Prudential, yeah. etc. The Uchenko company. They all lost. Yeah. They all everybody, lost the Uchenko company, same thing, went under mm. receivership. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So, is it still reversible? I mean, is it possible for, I mean, if it was by the stroke of a pen, um, destroyed the education we need industry, baka naman by the stroke of a pen, pwede rin ibalik? I mean, for the future, you know, for people like me who might have kids in the future? Well, uh, you know, the damage is so severe. Um, I'm not sure if uh, that's still possible. Anything is possible, but it will take a long time to repair the damage. It was working well before. It should go back to that system. Uh, now, whether it can be brought back to that and whether market confidence can ever be recovered, I'm not sure. Maybe there can be like a congressional inquiry on it or something. Maybe, maybe it's something maybe. that they should look into because maybe. I think part of it seems that CAP was a good program. CAP was an excellent program. They were the leader, they were strong, they were healthy. Up to today, all their assets are intact. Um, even if you started from scratch as a fresh grad um, and you somehow just on your own uh, were able to um, build all these businesses mm -hmm. um, what would be your advice to um, you know fresh graduates today Millennials and how to become as successful as you are you. well you know fresh out of college so taking my case um, I think uh, in the beginning, uh, out of college, you want experience. The right kind of experience, the best kind of experience, and you're out there to learn. And your priority is to learn from the best. So that should be your priority, more than the pay. Okay? So, um, and the next thing, when you have the experience, is you find something that's, well, let's just say needed and can do good. Uh, and I, I thought maybe the basic needs would be a good place to start. Food, clothing, shelter. Okay. Right? Businesses allied to somewhere of those three uh, basics in those days. Uh, food, but, but clothing, shelter. Management, education, which you were into, is real, not food, real clothing, estate, shelter. Eventually. Ah, okay. The, the uh, management side was the learning. Ah, okay. The experience. Mm -hmm. I didn't get paid a lot of money doing that. But you learned. But the you learning grew. and the experience and the expertise I got from mm -hmm. that was, was tremendous. And then uh, I chose uh, shelter uh, to do something, which is real estate. Uh, and more importantly, I think, uh, which applies across the board, is you have to be passionate about what you do. You have to Absolutely. love what you do, you have to be passionate about it. And uh, that way, it's, it's never worked, right? <laughs> if it's in the three basic needs, then commercially, you know it will be successful. If you're in food, if you do well, you know your food will sell. Clothing, if you design something well, or good products, you know you will sell it. If you're in shelter, same thing. I do now, um, food, shelter, clothing, Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> and these days, the internet is something. Right? You know, that's the fourth basic need. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that that's the fourth now. I've been a private partner of government for maybe the past, what, 30 years? Um, moving forward, what advice could you give this administration and the next and the next and the next um, in partnering with private sector in order to do nation building? Well, you know, uh, governments change, administration change, uh, largely because of politics. And I think number one is once you're in office, forget the politics, because now you're a public servant and you, you basically serve the public. Number two, look at existing contracts. You have existing contracts with private partners uh, and other people. Take a look at that, validate that, and if they're valid contracts, they're good contracts, and your partners have done well in their job, follow it, implement it. If there's anything I learned today from Bob Sibipenia, it's that nation building is not exclusive to government. Private sector plays a great role. Let's hope that men like Bob never lose their passion for nation building alongside government. When we all come together, maybe we will achieve our dreams for the country.